are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for all joining us. Um, my name is Zareen Kassad. I work at Digital Promise, which is a global um, nonprofit organization that aims to shape the future of education. We uh, bring together different types of stakeholders. We bring together researchers, education practitioners, solution technology providers, and communities to design, investigate, uh, evaluate and scale innovations that work and serve all students, especially those that have been historically and systematically excluded. So the panel I have on stage is a perfect example of the different types of stakeholders we typically bring together. And we're really excited to share some findings from some research that we've been doing together over the past three to four years or so. So just to get a show of hands, or in terms of who's in this audience, we're really curious. How many of you are education practitioners? All right, and how many of you are solution providers? All right, <laughs> that's really helpful context. And then I imagine there are some other folks in this room as well. So to kick us off, I imagine a lot of you are wondering, um, trying to get products into schools, which is one very difficult thing to do. And um, are, you're probably wondering what the secret sauce is for doing that. So hopefully we can share some perspectives on that. And I'm going to start off by um, giving you some background first on uh, the research study that we've done. So back in 2018, Digital Promise partnered with uh, the University of California, Irvine, MDRC, and a small startup company called Learning Ovations to uh, introduce A2I to schools across the country. A2I stands for Assessment to Instruction, and it was designed to help teachers in kindergarten through third grade uh, assess their students' reading abilities, group those students based on the assessment results, and then um, provide recommendations for the specific number of minutes and types of literacy instruction that each individual child needed. In addition to providing and developing this A2I tool, Learning Ovations, which has now been uh, actually acquired by Scholastic Incorporated, um, has a team of what we call literacy outcome specialists, or LOSs in short. And they essentially are literacy coaches who work with the teachers directly in the schools, either in person or virtually, and provide support for how to use the A2I tool in the classroom and how to differentiate their literacy instruction. So um, in the first year that we implemented this, uh, A2I was adopted in about 110 schools across 25 school districts across the country. And at Fontana Unified School District, they implemented the tool in about 16 of their schools. So Allison, who's in the middle here, um, she'll be able to speak to kind of the district perspective in terms of how that rollout went, and also speak to some of the decisions that went into place um, in terms of scaling the, the tool to more schools across her district. And then Mai Chu um, is from Digital Promise, and she and her team led a implementation study on um, how the tool was working in, in the classrooms. And her research team had conducted tons of interviews and focus groups with teachers, literacy coaches at the schools, as well as school principals and school district leaders to really understand some of the challenges around implementation and some of the strategies that people put in place to make it work. And then last but not least, Aaliyah, um, obviously she <laughs> kind of represents the solution provider. But she also has um, been a former educator herself. So she brings a very unique perspective, not just from the startup hat um, and solution provider hat, but she also can speak to the experience that teachers have had. So let's start off. The first question I have for all of us is, um, from your perspectives as a researcher, a district leader, and a solution provider, what would you say is the most important consideration to keep in mind when introducing a new product into schools? I'll go ahead and start. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. We appreciate it. Um, the biggest consideration is why. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably say a lot of things you already all know, but you sometimes forget as we get into the grind of implementing these kinds of programs. 
uh, but without a solid why. Why are you implementing the program? What is it going to support? What's it going to enhance? What's it going to change? And not only what is it going to change, but why do you need that change? So what's the urgency? There has to be a sense of urgency around developing that type of change and, and implementing a, a program. And I'll add on to that. The why is not only important for the uh, district, but also for the providers, because my why might be different than her why, right? We need to make sure that we are aligned on that and that the solution I'm trying to offer is actually answering the problem she's trying to answer. And sometimes we're just so gung-ho about trying to push our mission forward, we're not understanding how it fits into the context of the other's mission. And so that alignment of, of systems, but also understanding the context, uh, the ecosystem that you're stepping into, understanding you know, the human dynamic, the tech that's already there, the assessments that they're using. It's very important because if you have a misalignment from the beginning, you're always going to be slightly out of step and you're not going to reach those outcomes that you're both trying to achieve. That is so true. Ab absolutely. Understanding the why and really understanding the context that you're going into, really knowing who you're working with and why they might want your tool. Um, my two, do you have anything to add in terms of considerations? I think you two will probably speak on this too, but um, I want to talk a little bit about like the buy-in piece of it. Um, like early on in our research, you know, when districts started to roll out um, A2I into their schools, we learned that being explicit about the value proposition of the product, uh, specifically about what the product does and doesn't do, um, and what that you know might like how and how that product might differ from other products, um, was really important in leveling like teacher expectations um, and also garnering buy-in. Um, we learned you know in the first year of schools implement, uh, implementing A two I that this message about what the product could do was a little bit inconsistent, or at least there were different interpretations of what the like, product's offerings were. Um, and you know, some teachers expected the, the product to do everything, but in reality, the teacher role was still very big. Like, you can't get rid of what a teacher does um, in, in teaching and learning. So you know, all of this is to say that teachers and administrators who are um, looking to adopt or implement, like, they need to know not only what, you know, the product offers and doesn't offer, but also, you know, how the product fits into a school and district's um, strategy around teaching and learning um, and how the product really fits into a teacher's day-to-day -day, uh, practice and what that really means for the teacher role. Um, you know, having a consistent message about about all of that would you know really help level and manage people's expectations when it comes to implementing the product in in schools and classrooms. Absolutely, and so you know one of the things that we notice with um, teachers is that they they have a lot on their plates, right? We all know that, right? Especially after the pandemic, um, there's there's this sense of feeling really overwhelmed. Um, there's so much to do, so much pressure, also in terms of increasing students' assessment results, um, and a lot of times schools are kind of churning through different types of curricula, um, products, and tools, and so sometimes that can leave teachers feeling a bit fatigued, um, and, it, and it can also lead to some pushback. So my next question is kind of following up on this concept of buy-in, um, what are some specific strategies that you put into place to really um, help create that buy-in at the schools and get teachers to be willing to embrace the A2I tool and really take it on. Um, some of you might be familiar with John Cotter's work and his eight accelerators, and I could say that's definitely a, a practical system for implementing change. And he starts with this big opportunity. And our teachers have to believe that this is an opportunity to do something to change 
how their outcome, their outcomes in their classrooms. It's an opportunity to make a shift and make things better for students. So once they see it as a, um, a the I get to mindset, not this I have to, not something top down, we're making you do it. Um, it, it has to be that kind of feeling for a teacher that I get to be involved in something great and something that might change outcomes for students. Um, and, and once you, begin having those conversations and they understand the why and you've clearly communicated that with teachers, they get excited about it, then you kind of start to build a small kind of coalition. And that's what we did in Fontana. We uh, went out to our sites and we talked to teachers and we said, hey, here's this product. We think it can really help in in all these different ways. Who Who's in? Who, who wants to come on board with us? And initially we started with, I think it was eight schools and then we had 16 um, before we really know it, and now we have uh, 20 schools implementing. But you also have to think about for teachers, what are you gonna take off the plate? What is the district going to shift? Because we can't keep adding um, to what teachers need to do because they're already kind of up to here with, with the work that they have. So thinking about um, how does this impact their day, their time, and, and what can we take off uh, so that we can use this product instead? Yeah, and I think adding on, what was really important to us was to engage with the district leadership right from the beginning to ensure that there was, again, alignment with what the district was hoping to achieve, but with what the teachers were going to actually experience. And some of you may be familiar with something called the diffusion of innovation, which is just basically a bell curve that shows you know, how people adopt things. And the majority of users and stakeholders fall on the other side, which is the late adopters or the laggers, and some not at all, right? They don't want to do it. One of the things I would really strongly suggest is the teachers who fall on that end of the spectrum, it shouldn't be viewed as a deficit model, that there's something wrong with their implementation. They don't want to do it. They're lazy. They don't want to innovate. That's not the truth at all. There's a lot that goes into teaching that is so nuanced and that could you know, encourage or you know, push people in that direction. So kind of going back to Zareen's question at the beginning where she asked how many of you are educators in the room, a strong suggestion I, I think would be helpful is when you're engaging with districts on your team, do you have the voice of the teacher on your team? Do you have somebody who's lived that experience? Because a teacher's lived experience is like no other, especially the teachers that experienced COVID and experienced the, um, the shutdown. And so having a teacher experience to say, mm, that's not really how they're gonna interpret that. That's not, what, that's not how a teacher is gonna feel when you say that. I think that is something I would strongly suggest is make sure you keep having the teacher voice in the conversation um, throughout, throughout the process. But, the idea of thinking that a teacher is not implementing because they don't want to is a faulty line of thought. That's incorrect. Teachers are being made to make decisions all day long and they have to pick and choose. And if your product isn't innovative enough, if it's not getting them to understand the why and that this is an opportunity, they're always gonna be pushed back. And so taking that opportunity to reflect and say, what am I doing to reach the, other, the people on the other end of that spectrum? Not just the innovators, because those, those are the easy teachers, right? We all know those teachers. How are you gonna get the teacher who shuts the door on you? What are you doing as a provider to reach out to them and be reflective of that process that maybe it's you or me? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Really understanding the role that the, and the perspective that the teacher brings and know that not all teachers are the same too. So the experience that they have is different and maybe Maybe, my Chu, you could speak to this a little bit because this is something that we noticed with our research in, in terms of the need for teachers to have differentiated supports. Yeah, and this is, um, you know, this is gonna add on. Am I too loud? <laughs> yeah, this is gonna add on to uh, what Aaliyah uh, talked about a bit earlier about the local context, you know. Um, for us, like, the point of doing the research was to really understand local context. And I think, um, you know, when it comes to local context, I think of like two things where teachers are starting from, you know, their mindsets, their skills, their experience levels, their needs, um, and the context in which they are operating. So this includes like the curriculum that they're, uh, they're, they're using, other initiatives um, that are at their school, at the district, and other tools that they're using. Um, this is to say, your product may not be the only one and isn't the only product in school. So understanding um, 
just knowing both um, teachers' needs, mindsets, skills, and the context in which they work is really important in shaping supports um, that you provide to, to, to teachers as they implement your product. And really understanding the local context ensures that any feedback, any professional development provided are actually relevant and appropriate. Um, you know, we, we know that it's important to differentiate learning for students, but it's, it's just as crucial to differentiate the professional learning and supports for educators. So keep that in mind that, you know, folks are at different stages, um, different points, and learn, just know your audience and be able to cater to those needs will not only get more buy-in to use a product, but also use a product to make changes to practice, to instruction. Absolutely, and, and being willing as a solution provider to slightly adjust what you're offering to better meet the different needs of the educators that you're working with. Can I add on to that, what you Absolutely. said, Green? One of the things that I value so much about Allison is that she is a beautifully honest human, and she will tell me, you know, hey, this is, this is going a little sideways. We're going a little pear-shaped here. Like, what is going? And she, and that comes from trust, right? Because that is the ultimate trust, is honesty. If they're not being honest with you, they don't trust you. And so I think Allison and I really worked on that relationship. I, we have a, a director who also supports um, Genevieve, who's also amazing and supports the relationship at the district. But I would also encourage you to really develop the relationships, not just at the site level, but at the district level, so that they can get insight into what's happening, the context, like Mike, you said. But also, when things are starting to turn, you have a trusted partner to give you feedback in a way that's going to make you better, that's going to make you, you know, grow, and it's going to actually, in the long run, help the teachers have a, a higher buy-in. Yeah, so that's really important, I feel. And, and just real quick, um, it's, and it's not just about our relationship, because as Zareen mentioned, they have literacy outcome specialists, which are sort of like reading specialists that come and support our teachers. But I also have an amazing team of instructional coaches, one of which is here today, who also collaborate with the LOSs. So it's, it's not just this relationship, it's that relationship and the direct relationship that they have with the teachers as well. Absolutely. So let's move on and talk about some more of the things that made implementation really successful. In, in cases where schools were implementing in, um, and, and had really strong implementation, there were some things that needed to be put in place to really ensure that it went well. Can you speak to some of the things, specific um, strategies you put into place or um, systems and practices you instilled to make things go smoothly? Yeah, I'll start. Um, again, I know I'm probably going to say things that you all already know but sometimes forget. If you're not familiar with implementation science, get familiar because there are a lot of different phases that are involved in this and you have to be very intentional in every single phase. So when you're in your planning phase, you're just planning, you have to start thinking about, okay, what do my teachers need or whoever is going to be implementing this program? What is their skill level? What is, uh, do, do they have the materials? That, do they have the space? Do uh, what do they need? So in that planning phase, you have to be extremely intentional about not just the resources, but the people. Um, and then I guess time is a resource because that's the biggest resource. You have to figure out where you're going to get that because you need to have that time and space. So just be thinking about, you know, then you move into initial implementation. And to be quite honest, with the, with the disruption of the pandemic, you know, we are in year four, but it doesn't feel like that because we completely let go of everything for almost two years. Um, some teachers were trying virtually to keep things going but weren't able to. And so as we came back, I think this is our first real year back in this implementation. And you're going to have people that are in full implementation and some that are still in initial implementation. So how do you adapt and adjust for those individual needs um, for those teachers, those sites, those principals, those leaders? Um, and how can you, you know, customize those supports so that you don't leave somebody behind as you're moving through that implementation. 
Right. And thinking why you're here, you know, part of the titles, you think it's going to change the world. Assuming that's the case, the tool that you're potentially thinking through is not just going to be a gadget, right? It's probably asking teachers to change pedagogy. I'm making an assumption. But that is probably what we're here for, is to change instructional practice, to change behavior, right, through a, a technology piece. If that's the case, like what it is with A2I, we're asking teachers to make huge shifts in their instructional practices using a resource that's going to enhance their craft. Not replace it, but enhance their craft. And so if that's the case, you need to be ready to support the teachers through that, that process. Because for many teachers, their teaching style is their identity. And so if you're asking them to change their identity and just dropping it at their door and walking away, you're setting yourself up for a lot of people on the laggers late adopter side, right? Because it's too much of a shift and there's not that human component. And going back to what Allison said, that implementation science is not gonna speak to that. So it's very important that if you're asking teachers to change pedagogy, are you supporting the human? Or are you only supporting the product and the technology? If you lean too heavy on one, you're missing the opportunity. And education is about people at its core. So really making sure that if, if it's asking for those heavy lifts, do you have the professional learning that's going to support that? Do you have the resources that are going to help teachers feel supported and have that wraparound support? Thank you, Aliyah. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and turn to you, Maichu. Um, your team had led a very, you played a very unique role in all of this, being a third party organization that kind of had a, a lens into what was going on. And through your interviews and your focus groups, you were able to really capture um, feedback from the, the teachers and the schools that were implementing A2I. So could you speak to, you know, share a little bit more about why you did the research, the implementation study on, um, on this rollout, and what was the value in it? Zareen's being very modest because she is an integral part of the research team. Uh, she's also the project director for that team. So, um, yeah, our research team wanted to really understand implementation at different levels of the education system. So impl implementation happens at the classroom level, the school level, and the district level. So we were really interested in learning how teachers are using the tool, but also how they're making changes to instruction with the tool and how they were supported by school and district leadership, as well as the um, solutions provider, so uh, Elias team. Um, and we, we really wanted to understand, like, what are the factors that are facilitating and kind of in, like inhibiting implementation or use of A2I? So over three years, we spoke with about 160 educators um, across 22 schools in nine districts, and that's a very small sample of the districts and schools that Aaliyah and her team are supporting, but it's still a big enough chunk, right? Um, and the value of this work is for continuous improvement efforts to really support scholastics, um, continuous improvement. Um, you know, we really centered the voices of educators in our feedback and recommendations back to Scholastic so that they can make changes to the, the professional development and services, but also course correct if they, if they need to. Um, and also to think about other things as they're trying to expand to more schools and districts. And this is to say that, you know, it's, I mean, it's important to have a research partner. It's like, yes, give us a job, right? Or like, you know, hire us. But um, there's great value in knowing what happens in schools and districts when a product is adopted and implemented. Um, you know, you, you can plan for how a tool will be used, but once it gets into the hands of the actual practitioners, there are a lot of ways that a, a product can be used. And just understanding the different ways that people use your product will then help shape how you, as a solutions provider, um, support those, uh, those educators. Absolutely. There's, there's a lot of different ways they can be interpreted. Um, so Aaliyah and Allison, could you speak to kind of the role that feedback played in understanding how to make improvements to the adoption and rollout and um, 
you know, what, what that meant for you in your district and, and the other districts that you were also supporting, Aliyah, as well? I think first and foremost was the idea that even just optically for the teachers, they could see that we really were in it with them, that we were looking to get, you know, unbridled feedback from them from a third party organization that was going to synthesize it for us. And so they they right away, just from that perspective alone, it shifted the conversation that I'm not coming to tell you what to do. We're gonna co create this together and we're gonna take your feedback and we're gonna build on it. And so I think having my two be there over, you know, and Zareen come out and see the teachers in multiple times in the year over many years, it kind of reinforced that idea of, of partnership, which I think is so important um, when you're building relationships at the district. And then the actual feedback, you know, not everything was a home run. We, we were in districts that potentially shouldn't have been in, right? Because we didn't have that alignment of the why, and they didn't understand exactly what A2I was at the get-go. So now we know, you know, we learned, okay, why did that not work? What should we have done instead? Mm, this, you know, this, this approach that we took was the wrong one in this context. And so for us, it's that iterative process and having a, a partnership like Digital Promise was a really, like a gift I felt because every few months we get these beautiful synthesized packages that would tell us exactly what our um, partners were feeling and they didn't have to say it to us because I know there's sometimes that, you know, when you're, you're asking somebody for feedback, it can change depending, you know, because they don't want to hurt your feelings or whatever the case may be. But with having Digital Promise there, they were able to be really honest and we were able to hear it. The real challenge is in the reflection to not take it personal, to not get your, you know, but to really say, okay, what are we gonna do about it? What are we gonna do about this feedback cycle and how are we gonna improve? And what Mai and Aliyah are talking about in our world, we just call plan, do, study, act, right? And the study, act, it needs to be happening over and over and over again. You can't just study, act, okay, I'm done, we walk away. It's a continual reflection of where we are. Um, and, and in that, the outcomes of that study act have been helping to advance our implementation for sure. And I think you may, I, I hope I'm not skipping on to the next question, but um, one of the things that I think evolved from that was kind of a framework for what full implementation would look like. And now we have a tool that when we're walking into classrooms, we are looking at specific things to see where uh, where on this framework is the teacher and what next steps can we take with our teachers so that we could advance them on the framework. So a lot of those things evolve as you continue that study act cycle. Actually, a really good point that you brought up, Allison, in terms of just creating a framework of implementation so that you know exactly what it might look like for a, a teacher who maybe is not as experienced um, versus a teacher who has had years, like 25, 30 years of experience under, um, you know, to speak to, and how that pro progression in terms of implementation to fidelity might change over the course of that framework. So something to keep in mind or, or consider as you're thinking through your, your products. Um, also, so, sorry. yeah, um, I want to add that we didn't just speak with educators. We actually visited classrooms before the pandemic. So we were able to really see instruction in action as, you know, as a result of using this product. Um, so that was one great thing about having a third party do uh, data collection is that it's systematic. We, like Aliyah mentioned, we synthesize this information um, really like I mentioned before, like really centering uh, educators' voices. Like these are the folks who are doing the work. Listen to them, and you know, as researchers, we're able to do that. Absolutely, hearing what they say, and I think if there's one thing that I could take away from all of this, it would be you know making sure you're really connecting to your end user and really understanding what their true needs are and how those needs are different. Um, and then be willing to change, be willing to pivot a little bit based on what they're saying. So um, we're kind of getting to the, to, to the tail end of this. I wanted to talk about sustainability for a moment. Um, my Chu, after the three-year implementation study was over, our team had actually um, conducted another research study on the sustainability of practices in schools that decided not to use A2I anymore. Um, could you shed some light on some of the things that you learned and um, what that meant for sustainability? Yes. Um, 
Well, sustainability occurs at different levels of the education system, the teacher, school, and district. So for teachers, sustainability of um, practices related to A2I was like maintaining this mindset about really differentiating literacy instruction and using small groups to differentiate while using data to understand where students are, what, what, what their needs are. So for like, we learned that sustainability at the teacher level occurs after the first year of doing, like implementing the product, um, receiving supports, not after a tool leaps, right? And then at the school and district levels, um, concrete resources and coherence and expectations are really necessary to sustain practices. So in schools and dis districts where, you know, there's no longer, um, I guess small group instruction is no longer part of the strategy um, and the resources are no longer there to support teachers, teachers still understand the value in doing the work, but they're not supported, so therefore they don't have the capacity to maintain. Um, and then, for, yeah, in, in schools where there are the the concrete, tangible resources are there, the expectations are there, they're still implementing um, practices related to A2I, like differentiated small group instruction, um, and they're able to kind of expand this to other grade levels. Um, you know, A2I is K3, but we, we, you know, we talked with schools, they're doing this in you know, fourth through sixth grade as well, and some teachers are trying to do small group instruction in math, right? Um, yeah, so this is, um, you know, our, our study focused on like practices, right? And, you know, to the EdTech developers in the room, like your goal may be to stay in schools forever, but that, that may not be the case because of the reality of education, their teacher turnover, budget fluctuations, political environment, and just local support for education in general. So your product may not be in a school or a district forever, but Think about like the value add that your product um, it is, and like what its role is in changing practice, instructional practice. Um, when your product leaves, what what's the impact that you you know will want to have on a school in a district? Um, and I think it's also important to think about sustainability early on. It's like what does that look like? Um, what does that look like considering that your product might not stay in a school or district for forever, uh, given that there's just so many tools out there? Absolutely. So we have one final question. We're going to end with this one. Um, Aliyah and Allison, <laughs> knowing what you know now, what advice do you have for solution providers um, or even schools that are in the audience who might be trying to assess whether or not a district or a school is ready to implement and not just adopt the, a new product or a tool, but also sustain implementation over a period of time. Um, I think the most important thing is that it, as a district leader, that you are making a very thoughtful decision about a product because when it happens that you know you start to use something and we say oh it didn't work then we're just on to the next best thing and if you don't want your product to be the next best thing you have to have this really strong plan and supports in place and one of the things I think that is helping us hang on uh, like I said we had a, a, a little bit of a nosedive during that time off of school and so we know that implementation takes a bit of time, five years maybe. Um, and so, so driving that implementation, being fierce with, we made a decision together. We made it as district leaders and we included our teachers in that decision. And we're not gonna abandon this decision until we get to full implementation. If we can honestly say we're at full implementation and it's not working, then, then we walk away from the product. Um, but one thing that, that has helped us with that is your uh, data person, Russell, who has helped us to identify teachers who 
are very close to full implementation and helped us pull their data so that we could see the significant differences in achievement for teachers who are implementing fully. And I think that's really important because people are gonna wanna abandon your product because they don't see results. But if they're not implementing fully, they're not going to see results. So how are you going to address that in order to keep your product in that school or district? And one of the many wonderful things about Scholastic is it centers the experience of the teacher and the student, right? The thinking through what the student is gonna experience through their teacher, through their instructor. And I think really keeping hold of that idea of what is the teacher experiencing right now, in this moment, you know, in the context of fill in the blank, and at the time it was COVID or whatever the case may be, you know, teacher retention, however, whatever focus it is at the time, I think that is something that it's so important. And I think I, earlier on it would have been ex even better if we had started right from the scratch, really centering their voice and making sure that we were, were hearing them. Um, I think going back to tools, having concrete tools that teachers can reference and use. Um, I was a, a teacher for many, many years, and I love to print things out. It's 2023. I like to print it out, and I will laminate it. Like, I always joke to my husband, I'll laminate you if you stand still long enough. Like, I love, you know, like, we, we love that stuff. We love resources. So don't be scared to create things for them that they'll put in a binder and they'll reference 15 years later, you know, they'll come back to that. And even though I know we're in this age of technology, a lot of our teachers love to touch things and to experience things and interact with their coaches and have that craft developed. So I think, I think if I had could go back in time, I would have been more um, of an advocate of having resources for the teachers that they could tactfully hold and say, okay, this is gonna help me become a better teacher. But in the same breath, making sure those resources are non-evaluative in any way. Because the one thing that'll take a teacher from intrigue to I'm not doing this is if they feel they're being judged. If they feel like they're, this is some, if I don't do, the reason why this is coming into my classroom is because somebody thinks I'm not doing a good job someone's trying to outsource my craft, my pedagogy. And that is not, that should be the furthest thing in the messaging. Kind of going back to what Allison said, this is an opportunity for you to use something that's gonna help you. And so if you, that messaging, I don't know if we nailed that the first year that we were out there. And I think if I could go back in time, that would be something I would um, try to zhuzh up a little bit is this idea that you are the craftsman. This is a tool to help you paint your masterpiece. We're not trying to replace you, we're trying to make life easier for you. I also want to mention that, you know, A2I is K3, but if your product is for older students, like, talk to students. We don't hear, a student voice should really be part of, you know, development, um, do research, talk to students so that you can use their feedback to make changes to, better support their teachers so that teachers can support them. Um, I think student voice is missing in a lot of our work and at Digital Promise, we want to do that more. Um, so if your product is for older students, like talk to them, they're the end users. They know they're using the products. Like, they could tell you how they're using it. They could tell you, you know, their experience. And they're honest. <laughs> they sure are. <laughs> One of the things, uh, Leah, that you made me think about when you were talking about you know, how much teachers like to touch things and how much extra support they like, um, you know, in the very first year, some of, to be quite honest, with our research, we found some of the teachers um, were overwhelmed with um, how to use the assessment data that they got from the tool um, to inform their instruction. And one of the things that kept coming up was teachers just don't have time. They don't have time to prep. They don't have time to put together all of the different materials that they might need for an activity. And they were looking to you and your coaches um, for that extra support. And there was a point in time where, you know, your, your company actually had to assess for a moment at what like to what extent do we go down that path and provide those extra resources and really strengthen the relationships that we have with teachers versus sticking to kind of what the original intent of the tool was. Um, but you did make those shifts. And over time, I could say now at least, uh, teachers can, there, there's a ton of resources and a ton of like examples of what model implementation would look like now. Yeah. 
I mean, teachers move at the speed of trust, right? And so once they had trust with the coaches that were in their classrooms, they wanted to ask them all sorts of things as a literacy expert, as a previous educator. And it did get a little bit, un it can get unwieldy when there's so many things that you could focus on, right? And we're really hyper-focused on differentiated literacy instruction. And so it takes that you know, tension and that fine line to say, I'm going to support you in your pedagogy. I'm going to be that ear to help you, but we're, we really need to focus on what we have at hand. And that's that discipline to, to know your mission, to know what the goal is, to have alignment with the district. Um, because even though in the time it might feel, I don't want to say harsh, but it might feel like you're cutting them off, in the long run, it's a disservice to try to do everything for them. You need to really hyper-focus on the goal at hand and make sure that the metrics of success are aligning with what the district is also hoping to because they have their own coaches. And so in that relationship, we could reach out and say, hey, we're hearing this. This is a need for them. This might be some place that you can support. And then coming in in a different angle um, as a resource. Yeah. Every district is different too. You have to customize. You have to really get to know who you're working with and you have to customize. All right, so we are at time. Um, thank you so much, Aaliyah, Allison, and Mai Chu for sharing your perspectives. Hopefully this was helpful to all of you. And remember to center educator voices <laughs> in your work.